So Amanda and I have been together for 15 years, We've been married for eight of those 15 years. And um, in the beginning of our relationship, my life was definitely not focused around God being at the center. I put a lot of things before God, um, including sports, video games, uh, my own family, finances, worrying about finances. Um, but the, the thing that has been there for the longest time and probably the biggest um, thorn is a struggle with, with lust, sexual sins, pornography, uh, things like that. I was living wild. I was living the life, a worldly life, um, focusing more on myself as well and trying to gain attention from the world um, for the lack of attention that I've had growing up in my life. Um, and that really affected our marriage. Our marriage was um, simply just a paper contract. There was nothing spiritual about it. I had done some things in the past that I thought I would uh, hide from my wife and hide from everyone else uh, forever, take it to the grave. Um, but God had other plans. He brought it forward. Uh, so I confronted it, um, told my wife exactly uh, what had happened. And um, this was, uh, the moment that everything um, became real. I had no trust. Um, I was trying to find that trust, but I couldn't find it without God. So him being at the center of our marriage, I was able to trust in the Lord, and that made it easier for me to trust in my husband. God is first, and His, His words are truth. His words uh, direct me, uh, comfort me, and especially how about our marriage. When God is put in his rightful place, things change. Things are healed. Miracles happen when God's put in his rightful place. And we're going to be talking about that over these coming 10 weeks. Uh, I, I grew up in Southern California, just a short little drive from Disneyland. And so every year, at some point in the year, my family would pile into the station wagon. My parents would drive us to Disneyland and we'd spend a lot of money, I think it was like $14.95 uh, for a ticket book with e-tickets. And you remember ticket books, I'm, I'm aging myself, but it's before it was one price covers the whole thing. And we'd go in and, and the e-ticket, the, 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 the short little stubby one that you got one of was like for the Matterhorn and the big, the big rides. But I was too little when we first started going to go on the Matterhorn. The, the, the ride that I loved was Atopia. I don't know if they even have that anymore. But the Atopia, these little cars. And what I loved about the Atopia was I got to drive a real car. It was a real car. I mean, I was, I was putting down my carbon footprint, man. That thing, it was a gas-driven thing. And you were spurting out smoke. And, and you know, it had a steering wheel and a gas pedal. And I got to drive the car. It's like a real person driving a car. Well, a couple things. There was like, a, there was like a, a metal rail in the middle that you couldn't go off of. And there was like bumpers on the sides. And there was like a big bumpers in the front that if you bumped the other person, they had a lot of cushion to them. And so you couldn't hurt the person in front of you or behind you. But, but in my mind, I was free driving on the open road. And, uh, and then as you get older, you realize, oh, wait a minute. There's all these, all these safety measures that are there. And why did Disney, why did the Disney people put, put you on a rail and have bumpers on the sides and the front and the back? Why didn't they just give you a real car and let you race around Disneyland? And what's the answer? Because everyone would be dead, right? I, you, you, you can't put a five or six or seven year old behind the wheel of a real car and let them go wild. Those, those boundaries are there to keep us alive, to keep us safe, to protect other people. Ultimately, they're an act of safety and thoughtfulness, and I would say of love. And that's what the Ten Commandments are. The Ten Commandments are a gift from God to set us free. The Ten Commandments are God's, some of God's kind of railings to say, listen, the best life is lived, not just kind of running people down, but having boundaries. And, and how we relate with God, how we relate with each other. And, and it's interesting because the Ten Commandments, for a lot of people, they, they, they feel like they, most of you, I kind of know them. Let me ask you a question. In your own mind, answer this question. Have you ever heard of the Ten Commandments? Have you heard that term, the Ten Commandments? Most people probably have. Most people have. Maybe some people are like, I, I, that's new to me. It could be new. 
I mean, they're kind of scrubbed off buildings and walls. They're not really around much anymore. For some people, they maybe haven't heard of them. Maybe so. I saw an old movie one time called, called The Ten Commandments. Maybe not. But aside from have you heard of them, here's a deeper question. Do you know the Ten Commandments? Do you know all ten of them? Just in your mind right now. Just don't whisper to the person next to you. Don't raise your hand. Just in your mind. Just kind of go, okay, the Ten Commandments. I don't know. I've heard of them. They're just kind of... Can you come up with two or three, five or six? I don't know. I don't know what it is for you. I, I want to tell you, while you're thinking, while you're making your list right now, I want to let you know that as I worked on this sermon uh, and the sermon series, there's, there's, we're going to, the next 10 weeks, we're studying the Ten Commandments, one commandment every week for 10 weeks, and, I'll, and I have the chance to preach eight of those 10 messages. We're going to have a guest preacher come in, another shoreline pastor preach one, but I'll be preaching eight of the 10. So I read a series of different books on the Ten Commandments or portions. These three are commentaries. A commentary is basically a scholar who writes, looking at the language, the history, the background. He gives all kinds of background on a biblical text. If you want to know about good commentaries, there's three that I really enjoyed. Use those for research. These two books are written by an old friend and a new friend, uh, Kevin DeYoung, a pastor, a scholar. He's on the pastors of the church in the East Coast. I've known Kevin for over 30 years, and I read this book as part of my preparation for this series. And then Mark Mitchell, I met three weeks ago at a pastor's event uh, for the Bay Area Pastors, it was an overnight event, and so I got put in a room with somebody. I don't usually, I'm usually with my wife, but I got put in a room with a pastor, and I knew he was a writer, so I said, what have you written about? And he said, well, I wrote a book on the Ten Commandments. So I downloaded it and just read it on my, on my uh, tablet, but great book. So what I want to let you know is these books, and another book I've listened to, uh, audio book I listened to, so I've got six different resources. Why am I being so detailed? Because one of the Ten Commandments is, you should, thou shall not steal. And I'm letting you know some of the ideas I'm going to share with you, I borrowed from these people, okay? Uh, they write books, and I have a chance to write books. You do that to help other preachers, other pastors, and so they've written their things to, to share. And, and, and on the sermon we do on stealing, I'm going to share with you a story about listening to a person preach a sermon that was my sermon, that they stole. And they not only used my sermon, they used my life illustrations as if they were their own. I'll tell you more about that. that that's intellectual theft, right? So what I'm telling you right now is, if you, if you get either of these two books, this one's in our bookstore right now. This one will be in our bookstore next week and for the next nine weeks. If you want to get one of these and go deeper, you'll read some things and you'll go, ah, Pastor Kevin borrowed that. See? Then you'll know I wasn't stealing. But, um, and, and, I, and I think it's important because there's lots of ways to steal, and I don't want to be a stealer. But, I'm, but I've used thing, ideas there. I'm giving them credit. Thank you, you six people and scholars, for sharing great ideas that I could share with Shoreline Church. Okay, so how many did you come up with? How many of the ten, don't, don't answer. How many ten, ten commandments? Can you rattle off all ten? Can you come up with three or four? Here's what, a, here's what a study showed, a survey of Americans about how well they knew about certain things. What percentage of Americans could name all ten of the ten commandments? Here's the answer, 14%. I would hope in a church it would be higher, but you never know, right? 14% could name all the ten commandments. But there's an interesting contrast. 25% of Mer Americans could name the seven ingredients in a Big Mac. <laughs> and if you grew up in my generation, you could say them, and you'd, you'd all say them in the same order. You would say this. You would say, you can help me if you know it, two all-beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame bun. Some of your young people are going, How? that's creepy. How do you all know that? <laughs> all right. A great commercial campaign. A great commercial campaign where they drove it into your mind and it made you drive to a McDonald's, though you shouldn't. And anyways, that's another story. There's another sermon on health that we'll get to another time. 33% uh, of Americans can name all six of the Brady Bunch kids. And they stopped filming that in 1974. More than know the Ten Commandments. And 75% of Americans could name the Three Stooges. Some of you are, who are the Three Stooges? Some of you don't know? Well, look it up. You'll find it. So I want to begin by giving you what I call a summary of the ten words. The ten commandments are the ten words. Uh, and, and I'm going to use the name for God from the Old Testament in the summary, Yahweh. And the, the third commandment talks about honoring God's name, not misusing his name, the name Yahweh. And we'll look at what that name means and, and the meaning of a name and how a name is a person's character. But what I want to do is I want to ask you, if you're comfortable doing it, to robustly, wholeheartedly, and in unison... Read these Ten Commandments with me. These are sort of summaries. We're going to dig in depth to each one of them over the coming weeks. But we're going to put the first four commandments on the screen here. And when I give each number, then you can follow along with me. The first four of the Ten Commandments are, are vertical. They're about how we relate to God. 
The next six are horizontal, how we relate to each other. So the first four are all about how we relate to God. So the number one, let's read this together. You ready? Know God and follow only Yahweh. Worship only God, no other gods. Number two, say this with me, make no images so you worship only Yahweh and know his blessings. No images, no idols. That's the second one. Number three, let's read this together. Know God's name, his character, and honor him. Not just to know his name, but not to misuse it and to bring honor to his name. Number four, let's read this together. Remember, honor, and receive the gift of Sabbath. God says, I want you to rest one out of seven days. You're made for work, but you're made for rest. And now the next six, which we'll bring up here, these six are all about how we relate to each other. And as we read these together, I want you to imagine in your mind if every human being on planet Earth actually followed these, how the world would change. How much you wouldn't have to put locks on your doors. or I mean, it, the world would change. But So let's read these together. Number five, honor your parents. Number six, do not murder. Number seven, do not commit adultery or honor God's plan for sexuality. It's, it's not just not doing this one thing. It's the idea of understanding how God's made us as sexual people. Number eight, do not steal or honor people's stuff, right? Think about other people's things. Honor it, right? Number nine, do not give false testimony or be truthful. And number 10, do not covet or appreciate what you have and don't want what others have. That's the Ten Commandments. Now, we're going to dig into these for the next 10 weeks. Here's kind of a funny little encouragement for you. Aside from the, hopefully you do some regular Bible reading. Maybe you follow Shoreline's sermon uh, reading plan. Or maybe you have your own thing that you do. But I encourage you, every day for the next 10 weeks, to open to Exodus chapter 20 and read the Ten Commandments. And try to just commit, not all the words of it, but the 10 specific, try to commit that to memory. Because God has given them as a gift to set us free, to give us a path to live on, a path to drive on where we're not killing ourselves and killing other people. It, it, it's not, we're not saved by following the 10 commandments. We're saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. But God gives us his commands to set us free and to guide us and to direct our lives. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus uh, is teaching and he's asked, what's the most important of all the commandments, of all the commandments in the Old Testament? And here's what Jesus says in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. That's a summary of the four commandments about how we relate to God. Love God. You can put all those four into that one. And then Jesus says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. That's the horizontal. That's the six commandments and other commandments. All of God's commandments and laws can be put into kind of two big buckets. Love God. All the ways we love God. Love people. And we can fit all into those. But the fact that Jesus not only said these two things, but goes on in the Sermon on the Mount to take many of the Ten Commandments and expound them and explain them and actually to go deeper Jesus goes deeper into the, some people, some people today are saying, well, you know, the, the two-thirds of the Bible that make up the Old Testament, the first two-thirds of the Bible, those people say, that doesn't matter anymore. Don't worry about that. We're New Testament Christians. No, we're biblical Christians. The whole Bible. We don't throw away the first two-thirds of the Bible. And Jesus makes that clear when he says things like this. You know, you've heard that it was said, do not commit murder. He quotes Moses, Exodus 20, one of the Ten Commandments. He says, but I tell you, so let me explain to you, when you're angry in your heart, when you use harsh words, you can kill people with your eyes like daggers. You can kill people with your words like swords. It's not just don't murder. It's deeper than that. And Jesus takes the commands and goes even deeper because he wants to set us free and set the world free by his grace. We're not saved by following the commands, but when you know Jesus, you follow his ways because you want to, because you delight to. And so we're going to be thinking about that and we'll be looking at some of the passages where Jesus takes the Ten Commandments and expounds on them. So all through the summer, we walk in through this together. And, and here's one of the dilemmas. And this is one of the things that I've heard a lot in recent years. I've heard pastors who I respect and scholars say things like this. You know, Christians today don't need to worry about the Old Testament or we don't need to follow the commandments. All we have to do is love God and know that God loves us and say things like this. You know, what does love require of me? What would love have me do? And if we just follow what love would have us do, we'll get to the right results. Well, can I tell you a little secret? I don't trust me. I don't. Kevin, you figure out what love will do. 
I, I have the ability to deceive myself, to lie to myself. I don't trust me. Can I tell you something else? I don't trust you. <laughs> if you're new at Shoreline, you're like, well, that's kind of rude. You'll get used to it if you hang around here. Um, I, I don't trust you to, to establish absolute morals for humanity. You or me, I don't think so. I trust an infinite, eternal God who's perfectly morally pure to determine what makes, what sets us free and what gives the right guide rails for living lives of freedom and love and joy and peace. I don't trust me. I don't trust you. I trust God. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 3, we read these words. This is the beginning of the Ten Commandments. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God. That's the first thing. God says, I'm the Lord your God. Remember who I am. I am your God. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I am your God and I set you free. God says, remember who I am, remember what I do. I am a God of freedom. They had just come out of 440 years of bondage and God had set them free with might and power and glory and signs and wonders. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Know who I am, know who you are, and know what I've done. And then God gives the first of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. Notice there's a small g. It's not that God's saying there's lots of gods make me the most important. God is saying, God is saying of all those things that people think are gods, of all the false gods, of all the things that could draw your attention... Like we heard in the testimony, you know, where somebody says, well, you know, it was, it was video games, it was sports, it was, it was my family that all became the main thing in my life. That thing becomes, the, the thing that we pursue the most and love the most and focus on the most, in a sense, that becomes our God, small g God, even though there's only one God, Yahweh, the God of all the universe. But, but, but we're called, you shall have no other gods before me. If you're a note taker, you can write this down in your notes, we provide those in your bulletin. We have to have understanding of the world and the people who receive the Ten Commandments. When you read something in the Bible, and this is why these first three books from these scholars help a lot because they get into the history, the background, the context, the language, all that's going on there. And, and so to understand the world and the people who receive the Ten Commandments. So think about this. God's people have been in Egypt in captivity for 440 years. And Egypt is radically, thoroughly polytheistic. Polytheistic is a fancy word for saying they had lots of gods. They had a god for the gnat, the gnat, they had a gnat god, a frog god, a river god, a sun god. They had gods for everything. And can you imagine a people being in that cultural context for 440 years where all they've experienced is that's the way culture was. And so God is saying, I want to remind you, no other gods before me. Small g, they're not really gods, but don't let any of those things rise up. Not things you love, not people you love, and not false little idols. No gods before me, nothing before me. And not only are the people of Israel leaving Egypt that's thoroughly polytheistic, they're going into the land of Cana, which is also radically polytheistic. They have all kinds of gods. gods for, they have a fertility god, and they got the fertility god's girlfriend, and they, you know, and they got all, I mean, there's this whole pantheon of different gods, but God is saying, they're not real, but for some of the people at that time, they're thinking they're real. Why? Because that's all they've lived in, that's all they've experienced. There's times where people are so immersed in a culture, you have to slowly help them understand that what the culture is saying is normative, isn't real, and isn't right. I think we still have that need today. We have a lot of things that are, are, are so normative in culture and generations growing up that thinks that that's normal, that's just, that's just right, that's good because that's all I hear, that's all I see. And then all of a sudden, God says, but that's not real. That's a small G God. Turn away from that. And we have to decide, are we gonna follow God or the cultural norms of the world that we live in. And we, we have to make those decisions. So I think of it a little bit like when you're teaching someone to ride a bike. Uh, you know, with, with, uh, with three sons, we taught all three of our boys to ride a bike. And so when you start out, you put them on a really nice racing road bike with really thin tires, right? And you just send them down the road. Have a fun time, five-year-old, right? No, you put them on a bike that has, well, no, go back one. Uh, we're not there. On that, you know. If you put your kid on, switch forward. This one, when they're little, What happens? It's all bad stuff, right? So in some ways, what God is doing as he teaches his people is he's saying, you're coming out of this cultural context, you're going to this cultural context, you've been immersed in all this stuff, I need to ease you into it and help you understand that there is one God and that these other gods are small g gods, they're false gods, and identify that and choose to put me first above all else. Also, we have to understand that God is the foundation of all the commandments. 
Because all the commandments are about freedom. Because all the commandments are about God's love. God is the foundation of all the commandments. If we know him, if we love him, if we follow him, if we know the grace of Jesus Christ, we can then live into those commandments and live his ways. And remember, we're not saved by doing good things. It's like, well, if I follow all the laws and do it just right, then God will love me and he'll pull me into his family. No. He knows we're broken, we're sinful, we're rebels, and he loves us right where we are. And when we receive Jesus and his grace and his death on the cross and his resurrection and he washes us clean and we take his hand and we follow him, we have power to live for him in his freedom and love because Christ is in us. We're not doing good things so God will love us. God loves us, all right? But then we want to live in ways that honor him and that please him. God is the foundation of all the commandments. And God gives those boundaries, God gives those commandments out of radical love for his children. I didn't fully understand this until I became a dad. And then learning how to try to guide my, I have three boys, to guide my three sons on a path that was bringing life and hope and freedom. See, in our world, people think that this is freedom. In our world, people think this is freedom. I am free when I can do whatever I want. Whenever I want to. With whomever I want to do it. And I answer to nobody. But that's not freedom. Freedom. That's bondage. That's bo it, sounds like, it sounds like freedom. But freedom is actually, freedom is knowing how God has made us and then choosing to walk and live in the boundaries that God's given us even when they're challenging we don't understand them because God knows better than we do. Freedom is living the way God has made us, not however we want to. So think about a fish. Fish are free when they're in water. Take a fish and throw it on the beach and say, be free! <laughs> right? You've taken it out of the way that God's designed a fish to function, and that fish is going to die. Look at an eagle in the sky. I mean, the beauty, the majesty of an eagle. We saw, we saw a bald eagle when we were up near Yosemite uh, about a year and a half, two years ago. Just beautiful. Take that bald eagle and pull it underwater for about a half an hour and say, enjoy the freedom of the water. And like a, you're like a fish now. You're free. And that bird's dead. Why? You put them in their environment that God's made them for, and they soar. What we often do is we take ourselves out of the environment that God's made us for, and we say, I want to do what I want to do, where I want to do it, how I want to do it, any way I want to do it, and we think that's freedom. And it doesn't, bring to, it doesn't lead to life and freedom, it, it leads to bondage and death, and God's trying to teach us that. So as a parent, I'm raising these three boys and trying to learn how to give the right kind of boundaries because I love them. Well, when each of our boys hit the age where they were going to get their driver's license, how many of you as parents have walked through uh, walking with a son or daughter getting, getting a driver's license? And so how many of you anticipate that someday? Oh, it's going to be fun. Um, and so, uh, so each of our boys go through the, the, the school stuff and do the training, get the classes, and, and, you know, and then they, they get their license. And they're going to be out there driving my car or Sherry's car. In some cases, they had enough money to get their own car. And so here's what I did. I, this is kind of sneaky, but this is what I did. I kind of tried to create some boundaries to help set my kids free and to, get, and to protect their lives. All right, And so I said, I sat down with each of our boys. When they hit that point, I said, okay, here's the deal. Mom and I will pay for your insurance. And we showed them how expensive it was for a boy. Kind of sexist. Boys pay more for insurance. I don't know why. Maybe because they get in more accidents. But, um, but they do. So I said, as a teenage boy, this is how much has to be paid. And I said, Mom and I will pay it for you. Because we love you. We care about you. I said, but here's the deal. So here's the deal. Uh, if you get an accident that's your fault, any kind of accident that's your fault, or if you get a ticket, you have to pay half of the insurance of the new price, and it will go up. <laughs> and you get to pay half that. And so I, I tried to explain how much money that would be. So, and if you have another ticket, any kind, that's your fault, or an accident, you'll pay the rest of your insurance until Jesus returns. <laughs> and so I said, you'll, you'll, just, you'll pay the rest of your insurance. It'll be all on you. And here's about what it'll cost then. And as a teenager with a second accident or second insurance, it's going to be out the roof. And they probably would then lose the ability to drive because they would not be able to afford insurance. So I explained that really clearly to them because I'm a mean dad, right? No. You want to know why I did this? I'll tell you, and I'll tell you what happened. Here's, here's why I did this because every so often I would drive by this um, along a roadside somewhere. And, and we live in a country area where it seemed, like, it seemed like every graduation, within a week or two after graduation, a group of kids or a kid who had drank too much or were just being crazy, having fun, and just maybe weren't paying attention. And so parents and family members would go to that place and put the flowers there. And I didn't want to be, I didn't want to 
to have to experience that. So I explain this to my boys. Now, let me ask you a question. How many acts, now, so, now, three boys, so from, I told them, through high school and through college, will keep paying your whole insurance, all right? This is my own insurance policy for my boys, right? But I said, we'll keep, we'll keep doing this for six years. So 18 years of adolescent and young adult boys, young men. How many accidents in 18 years? Take a while, I guess. Zero. How many tickets? One. Now, let me tell you about this. This is kind of fun. Uh, <laughs> One of our sons, I won't name which one, comes home and says, I got a ticket. I didn't see. It was like a construction zone and the, the speed limit changed. Explained it all, but it, it was his fault. So what I did was I, I still had a joint account with his son. We did when our boys were a little bit of a joint account. So I went to his bank. I figured out from the insurance company what the new price of insurance would be. I cut it in half, and I went to his bank account, and I took out in cash the amount to pay for a whole year. And I got it all in $100 bills. And I laid them in a row across the table in the dining room. And I sat down with my son, and I said, unnamed son, that's not your business. I said, uh, uh, I said, see all this money? This came out of your account. Here's the receipt. You may go to your ledger now and take out all those hundreds of dollars out of your account. I said, that pays for this year. You'll be paying this every year, for, at least through high school and college. Mom and I will cover half of it, but the other half you got to cover and I scooped up that money and put it in my pocket and said, I'll pay it for you this year. And I want him to see it and feel it. And you know what? He never had another ticket. My kids drove like just super careful. Why? Because I'm a mean dad. Right? I'm a mean, nasty dad. Right? No. Why did I do this? Love. And freedom. I wanted them to have the freedom you driving because I didn't want to keep driving them uh, and so but 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 here this is what God does for us now we can choose to not follow what he calls us to do and we can choose to not walk in his freedom and not walk in his love but that's our choice but he says I love you so I'm laying out a way for you to go just a reminder as you think about this we are not saved by keeping the laws but by the grace of Jesus our salvation is based in the grace of Jesus Christ and his grace alone but when we know his grace we seek to walk in his ways also, the Ten Commandments are about freedom. The Ten Commandments actually set us free. If you can imagine our world with every single person following the Ten Commandments, no lying, no wanting what other people have, no breaking sexual boundaries, no, no murdering, honoring God, man, it would change our world. It would set us free. And here's a question. Can we make our own moral system? Personally or as a group? Can we say, okay, we don't need God. A lot of people say, we don't need God. And I'm going to share next week about this one group that came up with their 10 non-commandments. Like this group that came up with this uncommandments. But, but uh, you know, can, can we just, can we just, can I personally say, okay, I'm going to come up with my own moral code and have it be what really sets us free. I don't believe we can. Can we do it collaboratively? Can we all, maybe when we get human beings together and we all vote together, we'll come up with the best way for human beings to live. Because really, all of us are smarter than just one of us, right? Well, there's some truth to that, and I'm all for collaboration. But there's a great little story in Britain. Uh, they built this polar exploring vessel. It cost $287 million. You've got to look at this thing. This is, this is an icebreaker. It's used for polar exploration. And they decided they'd have some fun, and they'd let the whole country vote on the name of this vessel. Because, you know, all of us together are much smarter, Right? And so they, they, they had people turn in names, and then they advertised them, and then they voted. And when they finally voted, the, whole, the country of Britain, all those who voted, what name did they come up with for this majestic, beautiful vessel? Here it is. Bodie McBoatface. <laughs> That's what they came up with. Some of you are like, I like it. Uh, <laughs> well, that was the number one choice. Guess what? They didn't go with the number one choice. Because all of us aren't always that smart. They didn't go with a number two choice. They didn't go with a number three choice. Number four, not as you know, funny, but was actually this. The Sir David Attenborough, a great explorer, and they honored that person. That was, that's, that's the name of the boat. And you can pull it up online and look at it. You know? But Bodie McBoatface, and you go, I like that. But the point is this. The point is this. The idea that we can collaboratively establish a moral system. There's an infinite moral God who says this is how people are to live. He doesn't force us to live that way, but he invites us to. And if we live that way, it leads to freedom, it leads to love, 
It leads to joy, it leads to peace, and the things our hearts are longing for. So how do we embrace and live the first commandment? I mean, how, how do we, so, so, so this, this is the first commandment. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I set you free. So you shall have no other gods before me. How do we live a life where God, the one God, the true God, the, God, the glorious God of heaven is the one who we worship, who we adore, who we focus on, and all other potential rivals are pushed away to their proper place? You know, in the video this morning, somebody's saying, well, I was into sports. There's nothing wrong with sports. Just don't let them be in the central place of your life. Don't let them become your small G God. The thing you focus on the most, love the most, pay the most attention to, that becomes your God. Families are wonderful. But don't let your family become your God. Let God be your God. Amen? Amen. Let God be your God. And you know what? You'll have a better family because of it. You'll enjoy sports more because of it. Everything else will come into its proper place. So how do I embrace and live the first commandment? Here's a few thoughts. Worship God exclusively and passionately. Look at your life and say, am I worshiping this person? Am I, am I worshiping this thing? And I, you probably don't bow down and give praise to it, but man, does it consume my attention? More than anything else, that becomes a, a type of worship. Worship God it only, my, the devotion of my heart is reserved for God Almighty. But also passionately. And when you get to gather corporately for worship, worship with passion in your heart. When you're going through your day and something wonderful happens, say, God, I give you glory. I give you praise. Lift your voice. Lift your heart. Worship and celebrate God when you're alone, when we're with other people. Worship God passionately. Worship God and embrace him first and exclusively. Next, seek a deep relationship with God. Make walking with God and acknowledging God's presence part of your day. If you want to put God first in your life, don't reserve God for uh, you know, two minutes first thing in the morning. Okay, Lord, guide me this day. Now I'll take it from here. Now, throughout your day, when you're walking to the workplace, Lord, would you guide me and give me wisdom as I interact with people because I don't always know how to handle things. As you walk into your apartment with your roommates, Lord, um, help me show your light and show your love to other people. As you're at school, as you're, as you're in a, the community, as you're in social settings, say, God, I walk with you. Just invite God into your life. Not, not just a, a, an hour on Sunday, but in the flow of your life, and you'll begin to put God first in your life because he's there with you in all that you do. Recognize the love of God in the commandment. As we walk through each of the 10 commandments, I encourage you to recognize, how does this reveal the love of God? If we, if we say, do not murder, how does that unleash the love of God? Honor God by keeping the Sabbath. How does that show the love of God? Because God is giving these commandments to reveal his love and to set us free, not to put us in bondage. And we think when people give us rules, it's to put us in bondage, but not with God. He's giving us those because he knows us, he made us, and he wants to set us free. And ultimately, finally, if you want to live out this commandment, embrace Jesus as Savior and trust him and follow him every single day. You want to live out this commandment, you get to know Jesus. And you confess your sins to him and you receive his grace. And, you, and you, you say, Jesus, I accept your forgiveness. You've washed my sins away and that you love me, but also you're my leader. So I'm gonna take your hand. And every day as I walk, I'm gonna walk in your presence and walk in your ways and understand that you give me your word to set me free, to unleash me into the life you have for me. You know, when I was five, six, seven years old, uh, I loved the Utopia at Disneyland. I thought, man, I'm on the super highway, man. I'm, I'm, I'm driving a gas-propelled vehicle here. I had a gas pedal and a steering wheel and a brake, and I mean, I was in charge. But I discovered, as time went by, that that's not a real car. I drive a real car now. And the great thing about now that I'm a grown-up is I drive a real car, and now there's no rules. I can do whatever I want, right? No. If I do that, people are gonna die. And I've, dri I've driven a car... I've driven a car in England, in Scotland, in Ireland, in New Zealand, and Australia. And you know what those people do? They drive on the wrong side of the road. All of them. But I'm an American. So when I go over there, I drive on the right side of the road. I'm going to show them, right? No. <laughs> I, if, you, if you go to those places and you, and you drive on the incorrect side of the road, people die. It's dangerous. It's not freedom. It's bondage. It's, it's life in a cast. 
And, and so when I'm there, I drive on the correct side of the road. When I'm here, I drive on the correct side of the road. But here's the thing about our rules. Our rules can change from country to country. But God's rules as the perfect moral being are for all of us at all times. And his commandments are to give you life and to set you free. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray that over these 10 weeks, you'll unleash us into free lives filled with joy and peace and love because we are learning that we're saved by grace. But we who know you, who take your hand and follow you, that you are a God who gives us commands and truths to set us free, to protect us, to unleash us. So I pray that these 10 weeks here at Shoreline Church will be radically life transforming, that we will come with open hearts and open minds and a willingness to learn, and that you, O oh God, would set us free and reveal your love as we come to understand your commandments given as a gift from your hand. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.